Between the years of 1980 and 1982, three young women were murdered in Monroe and Swartz, Louisiana. The first victim was Angeline Roselle Hill, born to Mr. Eddie Hill and Mrs. Alice Trichel Hill on June 11, 1953, in Monroe, Louisiana. Angie's sister, Dorothy Hill, who went by Dot, said of her sister, and I quote, She was so sweet, if she had a dollar on her person and you needed it, she would have given it to you. In August of 1980, 27-year-old Angie was working at a convenience store named You Pack It on Desired Street in Monroe. On August 1st, she got off work, took a co-worker home, and then went to turn in the store receipts to the owner. She would sadly never make it home that night. Angie's car was found off Highway 139 around Melvin Drive near a small shopping center. When the car was found, the headlights were on, the engine was still running, and the radio was playing. It was as if she just stepped out of the vehicle and disappeared. Sadly, several hours later, Angie's body was found near an industrial park on Richwood Road 2. She had sadly been sexually assaulted and shot to death. The second victim was Kathy Jean Wharton, who was born on September 20, 1961, to Mr. Lee Roy Wharton and Mrs. Betty Jean Wharton in Bastrop, Louisiana. In April of 1981, 19-year-old Kathy was a sophomore at Northeast Louisiana University. On April 4, 1981, police found a blue Ford Mustang, still running, stopped in the middle of the road. Just like Angie's car, the headlights were on and the radio was playing. It also appeared the car had been rear-ended due to the broken taillight found at the scene. They ran the plate and it came back to Kathy's parents, who informed officers that their daughter was driving the car. Meanwhile, police received an anonymous call about a body on the side of the road. When investigators arrived, they sadly found Kathy dead from a gunshot wound. She had also been sexually assaulted. Missing from her was a topaz, pear-shaped ring, which the killer possibly took as a souvenir or to sell. The night of her murder, she and some friends went to a place called The Hangout to dance and have some fun. When Kathy was getting ready for the night out, she received a call from a woman on behalf of her ex-boyfriend who said he wanted to see her. While Kathy declined to meet him, this was suspicious to the family who initially felt that the boyfriend had something to do with her murder. Around 1 a.m. that night, Kathy and her friends split up because her friends decided they wanted to go back to the house with two boys they had met. Kathy, on the other hand, said she was going to meet a couple of friends for breakfast. Those close to her began to wonder if one of the people she was meeting was the boyfriend. The boyfriend was angry that they broke up, and Kathy felt he just wouldn't let her go. Hours after investigators found her body, they brought him in for an interview. He admitted to being upset about the breakup and wanting to see her that night, but claimed he was at a bar with friends until 10 p.m., which checked out. He said after he left, he went home and went to sleep. Due to his emotional response when he learned about her murder, plus the fact that his car had no damage to it, he was ultimately ruled out as a suspect. Investigators then found the two students she had breakfast with, and they were also cleared as suspects. It's possible her killer saw her leave the restaurant and followed her. The third victim was Sherry Lynn Alford, who was born to Mr. James Robert Alford and Mrs. Linda Joan Hells Alford on July 23, 1965, in Swartz, Louisiana. In early 1982, 16-year-old Sherry was a junior at Washita Parish High School and worked in the ticket booth at Cinema 3. Sherry's sister Tammy said, and I quote, She was very smart, very pretty, and just very full of life, as my dad said. On February 1, 1982, she left her job at the cinema and went to her boyfriend's home in the town and country subdivision. After leaving there, she was never seen alive again. Just before midnight, she was found dead on Highway 139 next to her 1982 Ford Compact. Just like Angie and Kathy, she had been shot to death. It appears the killer first shot her while she was driving, and that shot struck her in the left wrist, causing her watch to stop working at 11.57 p.m. Investigators determined that after being shot, the car came to a stop, and Sherry tried to flee before being shot one more time. It was that shot that ultimately killed her. Investigators began to think that maybe a person involved with law enforcement might have been the killer, but they could never prove that. Henry Lee Lucas and Otis Toole were also looked at. Lucas confessed to killing one of the girls, as did Toole. 
They were even getting a lot of the details correct, including shooting the victim and ramming her to run her off the road. The details were so convincing, they issued an arrest warrant for them. However, those arrest warrants were recalled, so they didn't interfere with Texas investigators. However, families of the victims weren't convinced the men were responsible. Years later, Kathy's sister, Debbie, called the investigator and questioned him about his conclusion. After an hour-long call with the investigator, Debbie felt certain Lucas and Toole were not the killers. For one, they had tortured their victims, and Kathy was never tortured. Plus, she realized that the information that the men gave investigators had been in the newspapers and was public information. She then began researching their confessions and discovered that a lot of them had been proven false. She then contacted Sheriff Tony of Washita Parish and learned that they hadn't closed the case because of Lucas and Toole, as she had been made to believe by another investigator. Once the men began to recant their confessions, investigators created a timeline and were able to show they were never anywhere near Monroe, Louisiana when the women were murdered. As investigators began looking back into the women's murders, they discovered that a lot of the information and photos were missing from the case files, but they still had DNA from Kathy's case. That DNA proved once and for all that the murders were not Lucas and Toole. Years later, the DNA was entered into CODIS, and they got a match to a man named Anthony Glenn Wilson. Wilson is a career criminal with more than 45 arrests on his record. He also had a warrant out for his arrest on a probation violation. So they tracked him down to a house not far from where Kathy had been murdered and arrested him. When he was brought in for questioning, he said he didn't know who Kathy was. After being told they had his DNA, he changed his story and claimed he had a sexual relationship with Kathy. Unfortunately, the prosecutor refused to prosecute him because of all the missing evidence. They tried to find the lost files but were never able to. So while they couldn't prosecute him for Kathy's murder, they were able to prosecute him on an outstanding case of burglary. Because of his past crimes, when he was convicted of the burglary, he was sentenced to 12 years in prison. Prosecutors then asked the judge to sentence him to additional time because of him being a habitual offender. The judge agreed and gave him life in prison without the possibility of parole. Unfortunately, since no one has ever been charged with their murders, these cases technically remain unsolved. After Wilson's conviction, Debbie wrote a book titled Sweet Scene of Justice. To this day, the families of the victims and investigators are still seeking information that might help officially solve all three murders. I'm now going to list some ways you can provide additional information if you have some. If you were followed or a victim of sexual assault back around 1977 to 1982, please contact someone at destinationjustice at yahoo.com. If you have any information on Kathy Wharton's or Sherry Alford's case, please contact Miranda Rogers with the Washita Parish Sheriff's Office at 319-324-2669 or Miranda Rogers at opso.net. If you have any information on Angie Hill's case, please contact Detective Jonathan Davis with the Monroe City Police Department at 318-329-4939 or jonathan.davis at ci.monroe.la.us. Also, you can call Crime Stoppers at 318-388-2274, who offers cash money up to $2,000. Last but not least, here's a special message from the families of the victims. A special shout out to many great friends who have been working silently behind the scenes, helping us with the cases. Special thanks to the other sisters who have been amazing to know. Also, a special shout out to Kivo Meredith and Carol Brown, who have worked tirelessly. I also want to thank Kivo's wife, Mary Meredith, for always letting us take over your home. Also, thanks to the Southern Girl Crime Stories YouTube channel for sharing our stories. I love you all. Elena Carlotta Roy was born to a large family in California in November of 1937. Those who knew her well described her as very family-oriented and said she was close to many of her siblings. In 2021, 83-year-old Elena was living with her partner of 14 years, Chris Cataldo, in Fallbrook, California. They had a wedding ceremony, but the marriage was not legally recognized by the state of California. The two met after Chris was released from prison after serving a seven-year sentence. 
Regardless, her family was very concerned, but eventually learned to trust him. However, they said he never liked for them to come around. Chris told a different story and said that Elena was the one distancing herself from her daughters. In 2021, Elena was living with dementia and was known for walking away from her home at times. On November 2, 2021, Elena and Chris were caught on surveillance at the grocery outlet on Main Street. The following day, Chris reported her missing. He told investigators the two got into an argument around 1 p.m., causing her to leave on foot, never to be seen again. For some reason, Chris waited until 8.45 p.m. to notify her family. He also waited until dusk to go look for her. He could strangely never explain why he waited, except for saying that one of the other times she walked away, she came back around dusk. Her family also found it odd that he would even let her walk off alone, considering she had dementia. Not to mention, Elena and Chris lived only a block away from her daughter Jessica. When she left, she was allegedly wearing the same clothes she was wearing on November 2nd. However, it's strange no one saw her considering how small of a town it is. It's possible due to her dementia that she got lost after walking away. However, large searches of the area turned up nothing. One of the other times she walked away, a fireman picked her up and took her to the sheriff's station. He said when Chris showed up to get her, he found him oddly calm. He said one of those times she walked away was when they were at grocery outlet and she got mad at him for adjusting her mask. After she disappeared, Chris moved away from Fallbrook and only helped the family search once. He did cooperate with investigators, though. While there is no physical evidence to suggest foul play, investigators theorize Chris might have been tired of caring for her. It's also possible that he moved away because he believes she is already dead and gave up on finding her. He even said in an interview, and I quote, She hasn't shown up. It's been cool days, cold nights, fog, and it destroys me to think where she might be. She might be in a ditch, half dead, or fully dead or something. He also added, I hope I am wrong, but I am holding out hope. A couple of months after she disappeared in January of 2022, Chris called one of Elena's daughters and asked her to come get her mother's things, which she did. However, he didn't give her everything, and the following month, he listed a garage sale on Craigslist. When Tammy showed up at the garage sale, she found him selling many of her mother's items. Unfortunately, as of 2024, Elena remains missing, and this case is still unsolved. Jacob Paddock Weeks was born on May 15, 1991. In 2019, 27-year-old Jacob was living in Indian Hills, Colorado, when he strangely disappeared. He had been living with his girlfriend of three years until they broke up in December 2018. He then began staying off and on with his grandmother. On the night of Thursday, January 31, 2019, he and his friend slash uncle Jonathan, who is actually younger than him, got into an altercation. It's unclear if this had anything to do with his disappearance, but on Saturday, February 2nd, Jacob's white Dodge Ram truck crashed into a guardrail, causing it to spin around. A man was then seen getting out and walking away, even though the damage to the truck was minor. While it's thought the person was Jacob, it's never been 100% verified. Regardless, Jacob was never seen again after that weekend. Inside the truck was his wallet, ID, two cell phones, and a small bag of drugs. Jacob's family had learned of the fight between him and his uncle and had been calling him all weekend to find out what happened, but he never responded. By Monday, his father and stepmother, George and Amanda Weeks, decided to report him missing. After that, they began calling numbers from his phone, but were surprisingly not always met with the friendliest of responses. They've also tried to find out where he had been after the fight with his uncle, but people either didn't know or were refusing to talk. Unfortunately, Jacob had an issue with drugs and alcohol, and before he went missing, his paranoia had worsened, and he began talking about strange things. One of his hang-ups was he often thought people were listening in on his phone calls. He also began talking about lizard people, which is a conspiracy theory regarding nations being led by evil reptiles. If foul play is not involved in his disappearance, he could have suffered a concussion when he wrecked the truck. Unfortunately, four days after the incident, a major blizzard hit the area, seriously hindering all search efforts. Tragically, this isn't the first time Jacob's family has experienced a loss. 20 years ago, his father's sister was murdered and her case was never solved. 
It's now been over five years since Jacob went missing, and as of May 2024, this case remains unsolved. Kyle Christopher Seidel was born on April 17, 1978, to parents Richard and Darlene, and grew up in East Lyme, Connecticut. In 1996, Kyle graduated from East Lyme High School, and then in 2001, he met and fell in love with Kate Chachi. They married two years later, moved into a place in Waterford, Connecticut, and went on to have three children together, two daughters and a son. Kyle was said to love the outdoors and Chevy trucks. He was also described as a person with a great sense of humor who loved animals. He's also had a passion for fishing and eventually bought the boat of his dreams. By 2012, 34-year-old Kyle seemed like he had everything going for him, a wife, three kids, and a job at Essex Island Marina. But unfortunately, all that would be taken away from him. On December 21, 2012, Kyle went to the Lucky Inn Walk Chinese restaurant to pick up takeout. After leaving, his family would never see him alive again. While on his way to get the Chinese food, he stopped at the halftime sports lounge connected to the family bowl for an unknown reason. That's where an unknown individual shot him once in the parking lot. He was rushed to the hospital, but sadly didn't survive. Unfortunately, years have gone by and no arrests have been made, and as of 2024, this case remains unsolved. Timothy Beauchart was born on December 20, 1983, and went by Tim. In 2017, 33-year-old Tim was living in Purvis, Mississippi, and was described as having a magnetic personality. A few years ago, when he was 25, he had surgery and was prescribed painkillers, and unfortunately became addicted to them. On or around August 30, 2017, he abruptly stopped his prescribed oxycodone, a medication that needs to be tapered down to prevent withdrawing from it. His girlfriend then drove him to Laurel, Mississippi, and dropped him off at the Mission at the Cross, a recovery center that helps people with homelessness, drugs, and other struggles in their lives. On September 3, 2017, while at the center in Laurel, he attended church services and then went to the services at Highland Baptist Church, about three miles away. When he left that church, he had a friend give him a ride back to Purvis, and he was dropped off at a home on Zeb Circle and then another home on Llewellyn Drive. After that day, he was never seen again, and the people he was with have allegedly been very uncooperative and have even been caught in some lies. They claim they weren't even with him on that day, but others have confirmed they were. Sadly, people have also tried to extort money from his mother for information on Tim's whereabouts. She was told by somebody that he overdosed, which could be very likely. Tim's mother is not even denying that fact. She just wants her son's body back if he is really dead. Unfortunately, it's now been over six years since Tim went missing, and as of 2024, this case remains unsolved. <laughs>